a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is uh, Tuesday, the 2nd of January 2018, and um, I have come to the microphone to read to you the next, the 19th part of the book from Martin Luther, 1545, Against the Roman Papacy, an Institution of the Devil. There is only about five pages left, and I don't know if I can make it in this reading, or maybe in two. I have no idea. We'll see. I'm not rushing anything. I think it is of a quite importance that we really understand Martin Luther's motivation to write that the papacy is the Antichrist. By that, in my opinion, he takes away even the focus of the 95 Thesis, which were only dealing with the problem uh, with the problem of the uh, indulgences more or less and he declares the papacy to be the biblical prophetical and historic antichrist a fact on which all reformers agreed on all reformers of the 16th of the 17th of the 18th of the 19th and I don't know if we have any reformers in the 20th, but there were a lot of people who were in the reformational mindset in the 20th century also agreed that the papacy is the Antichrist, who did not fall for the Jesuit deception of a future Antichrist based on a false interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. That is the pillar that futurism stands on, and... Um, I would otherwise like to advise you to go to my YouTube channel and check out the playlist Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update, um, where I did 14 readings with Tom Fress on the little booklet The Origins of Futurism and Preterism. And then you see that the Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> who says of itself that outside her there is no salvation possible, that she has two official each other absolutely excluding dogma's teaching. The dogma of uh, preterism, the Antichrist is a fulfilled historical figure within the very first centuries after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, or the futurist one, which all the world today now believes, but both are official doctrines and dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, but they are mutually exclusive. You cannot have both. It must be the one or the other. But still the Roman Catholic Church teaches and taught both of them. And Tom and I, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and I go into that little booklet that was written, uh, The Origins of Futurism and Preterism, and explain that. And Martin Luther didn't, didn't even need that. And in Martin Luther's time there was no futurism. <laughs> Why? Because Francisco Ribera, who wrote a 500 pages pamphlet on the futurist doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, did so between the years 1585 and 1590, uh, 1590. That was after Luther even died. So at the time that Martin Luther was busy, there was no futurism. There was only what we call today historicism. There was only the biblical view. And that's what you have to understand when you call yourself a Christian. Don't go whoring after other gods. Don't go running after other dogmas or teachings that even came later than the Bible. Because, listen what the Bible teaches on the Antichrist. And that's what Martin Luther did in this book, Against the Roman Papacy, the Institution of the Devil. He biblically confirmed that the papacy 
was, is and always will be until the, until the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Antichrist of the Bible. We have come now to page 371 on the last, uh, latest, uh, on, the, on the last paragraph on that page. Part 3 of this book begins and I will begin reading here. So when you have a copy of your own book, you know where you can follow. And uh, let's see where the Spirit takes us today. Martin Luther says, whether the Pope transferred the Roman Empire from the Greeks to us Germans, this is quite plainly a crude and an obvious lie, which everyone can see and grasp. First, where would the Pope get such an empire? And how could he give what he did not himself have? He himself, in Rome, was not safe from the Lombards, who had at the time ruled in Italy for 200 years. What a fine present that would be for me, if I, a preacher in Wittenberg, were to give the kingdom of Bohemia or Poland to the elector of Saxony. And to give an example from our day, wasn't it a fine gift when Pope Leo X gave King Francis of France the empire of Constantinople? What does Martin Luther say here? Pope Leo X gave King Francis of France the empire of Constantinople? Well, in a footnote, in a footnote here we read, in 1517, so that's, <laughs> that's the year that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. In 1517, Antichrist Pope Leo X advocated a crusade against the Turks. He especially advised Francis I of France to attack Constantinople as soon as possible, promising him the conquered land. The crusade, however, never took place. Instead, Francis I tried to become Holy Roman Emperor when Maximilian I died in 1519. Though favored as a candidate Francis I was, he lost his crown to Charles V. You know that Charles V was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire during all the working time of Martin Luther in the Reformation. On Luther's sources, you can read on Schaefer, Luther dealt with the problem of papal political authority in 1520 in his writings, an open letter to the Christian nobility. And that is one that I read in English in Hour of the Truth. So when you go to the archives of Hour of the Truth, you can avail yourselves on these broadcasts and understand what Martin Luther wrote in 1520. But did you know that Antichrist Pope Leo X promised the King of France <laughs> the whole Orient by way, by way of speaking when he goes on a crusade against the Turks? Yeah, the beginning of the 16th century the Turks, Islam was a real threat for Europe at that time. And as I said last time, as far as I remember it was last time in this reading, we have to understand that Islam is founded and controlled still today by the Roman Catholic Church, by the papacy. It is another military arm. The Jesuits are one military arm of the Roman Catholic Church and Islam is the other. Put these two together and they embrace the whole world, squeeze it, and by that squeezing will splash out the blood of the saints and the martyrs and what's over is Satan's kingdom. That is to come as much as Satan wishes for the fulfilling of the quote-unquote new world order. So, we have just read now that if the king had not been smarter than the pope, and had not despised his foolishness, what a comedy and what laughter he would have created with the empire of Constantinople. They are truly quite mad and silly, these Roman asses, with some reason which is a monstrosity. Uh, with, with sane reason, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> they are truly quite mad and silly, these Roman asses, with sane reason which is a monstrosity. The devil, Martin Luther continues, through, <coughs> through God's wrath over our sin, has fertilized us with big bad fools and big crude asses in Rome, who think only in this way, quote, We read no books, so nobody else will read them either. Instead, 
the beasts will have to regard as articles what we asses fart and dung. The reason? They believe we are St. Peter's heirs and cannot err." Unquote. Very, very important way that Martin Luther describes the thinking of the papacy. Again, we read no books, he says, of the Roman hierarchy, of the popes, because they don't read the Bible, therefore they don't know the Bible, therefore they don't teach the Bible. No, they hate the Bible. We read no books, he says, so nobody else will read them either. So, you know, if I cannot read books, because I don't read books, and I cannot read books, you cannot either. That's what they say. Instead, the beasts will have to regard as articles what we asses fart and dung. And who is the Pope here calling beasts? The laity. The people of the world. All of quote-unquote mankind. Or as he loves, loves to say it, quote-unquote humanity. The reason? They believe we are St. Peter's heirs and cannot err. So when we believe that the Pope is the heir, the righteous heir of St. Peter, who has not been given the keys anyway, but if we believe that, and the papacy cannot err, as then was later uh, fastened in the First Vatican Council in 1870, but even at Luther's time it was not official Roman Catholic dogma, but the Pope was infallible already a long time in the dogmas and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. So when we quote-unquote normal people believe that the Pope is the heir of St. Peter and cannot err, then of course we have to obey when he says we also have to read no books because he doesn't read any books. The histories, Martin Luther continues, against which the Pope's farts count for nothing say this. When Constantine the Great moved the imperial residence from Rome to Constantinople, Byzantine at that time, which was a sign that Rome was nearing its end, Rome decre decreased from day to day until the Goths under Emperor Honorius came and conquered Rome with all of Italy. Yeah? This Emperor Honorius was a Roman emperor of the West between 395 and 423, during the last days of the uh, old pagan Roman Empire. Then came the Vandals, and then the Lombards, so that Rome was conquered and plundered four times within 100 years by the Goths and the Vandals alone. You must read the histories about this. The Goths and the Vandals, especially the Vandals. The Vandals is a people that had been rooted out by the roots, completely by the roots, by the Roman Empire. The Ostrogoths, the Heruli and the Vandals are three people who have been rooted out completely of the face of the earth. Very, very difficult to have any historical understanding of those people because they have been rooted out. They have been taken out by the roots. There is nothing left of them anymore. Very, very hard to find anything to study on this. I went on this in um, the characteristics of Antichrist. Uh, that is one of the characteristics of Antichrist because that is a prophecy that that will happen, that the little horn will root out three kingdoms by its roots. And this is what Martin Luther here speaks about, the Vandals. Yeah. The Goths and Lombards were Germans. Since Rome and Italy were nearing their end and were in their death, to, uh, death throes and the emperors in Constantinople could no longer rescue or help them because they had enough to do with Goths, Persians and Saracens, and since the German lands, France and Spain were gone from the Roman Empire, and Italy too was subject to the Lombards, so that Rome was nothing anymore, they attached themselves to the Pope. When they heard that Charles the Great was a powerful king who had united France and Germany under one crown, 
they coaxed him into their side against the Lombard kings, who have now been ruling Italy cleanly and moderately for two hundred years, and had become cousins, aunts, sons, daughters, and in-laws to each other. The land of Lombardy is still called after them. Then Charles came to the aid of the Pope against the Lombard kings. Listen and read the histories, Martin Luther puts here in brackets. And Charles was now a pious, devout Christian. While Charles was in church in Rome on Christmas Day, the Pope called out that he was Roman Emperor, without his knowledge and consent. Charles said afterward that if he had foreseen this, he would not have gone to church, nor would he accept or bear the title Roman Emperor from the Pope's screaming until those in Constantinople had been consulted and had consented to it. So Charles was given the name of Roman Emperor of the West, as those in Constantinople were called of the East. Now we are speaking about Charles I, the Charles the Great in the 800s. As those in Constantinople were called of the East, because those in Constantinople had now lost the Western Empire and were unable to support it. Such a division of the Roman Empire was neither new nor was it at uh, was uh, nor the first at that time for previously Theodosius had divided the empire between his two sons, Arcadius and Honorius. Um, this is in 395 through 408 and Honorius from 395 through 423. And Constantine the Great had divided it between his sons, Constantinus, Constans and Constantine. Yeah? Constantius the Second. Constans I and Constantine II divided the empire at the death of Emperor Constantine I in 337. In 350, Constantius II became sole ruler. Okay. Indeed, also Augustus and Antonius, in another footnote we learn that Antonius was involved in the civil war following the death of Caesar in 44 BC, Julius and Pompeius, and um, this is of course then dealing with Diocletian and Maximani uh, uh, Maximianus, um, Diocletian Roman Emperor from 284 through 305 appointed Maximian joint emperor in 286, and so on and so on that the Roman Empire was divided between two or three hats most of the time and rarely came under a single hat. Now why is this important that we read of constant dividing of constant dividing of the Roman Empire in the time? Because the Bible says an empire divided in itself cannot stand. So what does that refer to? Well historically as you can see to Rome with all the different emperors they had, Arcadius and Honorius, Constantius, Constans and Constantine, Augustus and Antonius, Julius and Pompeius, Diocletian and Maximianus, and so on, as Luther says. A kingdom divided in itself cannot stand, the Bible says. Rome cannot stand because it is divided in itself and the biggest division came then when Constantine went to Constantinople <coughs> sorry in uh, in Turkey and founded Constantinople the city there and ruled the emperor the Roman empire from the east and of that <coughs> because of that left a power vacuum in the west which was filled by the Bishop of Rome. The then later, through Emperor Phocas, made universal bishop, became the Pope, as we know him today, the papacy. Very interesting and important history lesson that Martin Luther gives here in the conclusion of his work.
But the Pope's words sound as though he had taken the empire from the Greeks and turned it over to the Germans. That is a lie. And pure papal twaddle. In the first place, he could not take anything from the Greek empire and gave it away. On the contrary, the Roman Empire of the East remained in Constantinople and the Emperor in Constantinople has always called and signed himself quote-unquote Roman Emperor, just as our Emperor signed himself quote-unquote Roman Emperor, except that the one is called Constantinopolitan and ours the German Emperor. The reason for this is that neither one had his residence in Rome, but both were of the same Roman Empire divided, as was said, one part in the East and the other in the West. And both agreed to this, for Charles had an embassy in Constantinople and the other had his embassy in Aachen, in uh, the western region of Germany. Empress Irene first made such an agreement with Charles, and following her, Nicephorus and Michael. And here in a footnote we read that Luther's source here is Platina. Irene, and the Empress of the East between 780 and 802, so of the Kingdom of Constantinople, when you want to call it that way, Nicephorus I between 801 and 811 and Michael I uh, uh, succeeding that until 813 tried to maintain the political balance between East and West but became more and more dependent upon Charlemagne and therefore we can see in a book from Hans von Schubert. Yeah? So I'm going to read this sentence again. Charles had an embassy in Constantinople and the Emperor of Constantinople had his embassy in Aachen. Empress Irene first made such an agreement with Charles and following her Nicephorus and Michael. As proof, Venice was accepted in the agreement so that it could be autonomous, subjected neither to this nor to that emperor. Venice, which of course lies in Italy, always has been in Italy, was no part of Italy, it was a own state. There are a few other quote-unquote papal states that were own states, cities like Florence also. Yeah? Venice was um, autonomous. Yeah? It was subjected, Venice was subjected neither to this, meaning the East, the Eastern Emperor, yeah? Constantinople, nor to the other, nor to the, uh, nor to that emperor, meaning the Western emperor, Charlemagne. Yeah? Neither to the successors of Constantinople, uh, of, neither to the successors of Constantine in the east, <coughs> nor to the reigning, quote unquote, Roman emperor Charlemagne and his successors in the west. The Pope's historians write the same thing, such as Platina, etc. They say further that Otto II, our German Roman Emperor, the son of Otto the Great, had married Theophania, the Roman Emperor John of Constantinople's sister, from whom Otto III was born, and that Otto II moreover reinstated his brother-in-law, Emperor John, in Constantinople, after he had been dethroned, so that Otto III could, from his mother, also have inherited the Roman Empire in Constantinople. That is why the Pope has not transferred a hair's breadth from the Greeks to the Germans, as he dupes us into believing with his vain words. Second, much less did the Pope transfer or give the Roman Empire of the West to the Germans. What could he give, who himself had nothing? Charles had inherited France and Germany from his father Pepin, and had fought for thirty years against the Saxons. For the lands of Germany, France and Spain, as what said, had long since broken away from the Roman Emperor, Empire, 
and Charles had to win Italy from the Lombards with the sword and save the Pope. After this he also conquered Hungary, so it is true that Charles received nothing from the Pope except the mere name, quote unquote, Roman Emperor, which in any case he did not want to accept behind the back of the Empire in Constantinople, as we have heard. But this mere name has a cost <coughs> but this mere name has cost the Germans much, for the popes afterward made our emperors into vassals. If the Pope and Italy lacked something, our emperors have had to assist them with their own expense. They then rewarded and thanked them with knavery and villainy, poisoned some emperors, beheaded some emperors, or otherwise betrayed and killed them as the papal holiness and the devil's spirit should and was forced to do. But with a mere name and empty titles, they have nevertheless dug in their claws more and more, later strengthening this with the coronation and uh, uh, anointment, longing more and more for the empire, so that they, the robbers of convents and regicides, could take what the Germans had inherited or won with the sword. According to the proverb of our Lord, John chapter 4, verse 37, quote, one sows and another reaps. Yes, I say these rotten, abominable paunches would like to be emperors through the property and blood of our, of our Germans. They would also like to have had the election for themselves. Ex de electio se venerablem. This is a uh, footnote here, 240, a decretalium of uh, Gregory the Ninth. Again, Kashitan is trying it with this emperor, Charles II. Yeah? This is a reference to the curious attempt to influence the emperor during and after the Diet of Augsburg in 1530 through Kajetan's diplomatic moves. For a detailed account, you can look at the work of Schwiebert. Okay? Now the point is that Kajitan is trying it with this Emperor Charles too. Uh, they have created great misfortune by deposing the Emperors through the ban and, in the most despotic way, commanding the election of others. Finally, they have also subjected the Emperors to themselves through sworn duties, which the devil ordered them to do. But all this is because they want to be emperors themselves over strangers' property. They have also often tried to transfer the mere title from the Germans to France, so that they could play with this king as they did with the German emperors. Now I understand that when you hear me reading this, it is not so easy to follow. The point that actually is made here is that... <coughs> There has always been an emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople, since Constantine went there in the beginning of the 4th century. And there has been an emperor of the Western Empire, beginning with Charlemagne in 800. In the old pagan empire, the emperor was the highest person. He was the ruler, the supreme ruler. Like you know from Caesar and Augustine and Nero and Caligula and all these Roman emperors, they were sovereign rulers over the complete empire. But the Pope did everything to exalt himself above the emperors. You remember probably that we spoke about that already in the very first part of Martin Luther's book. Because the very first point that he wanted to address is that he said whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom, above councils, emperors and angels. Above emperors, you see? So we are actually going a little bit back here with the history lesson that I'm reading to you here to the very first point, that 
the Pope of Rome exalts himself above the emperors. Rome always was a political power, paper Rome was always a political power and the emperor was the highest authority. Now the Pope says, I am the highest authority and I even crown the emperors. Yeah? That is the delusion that Martin Luther deals here with. That all this, he says here, but all this is because they want to be emperors themselves. The popes want to be emperors themselves. The Pope wants the title of universal bishop, the spiritual authority, and universal civil ruler, the emperor, the other crown. That's why he has these two keys, the temporal and the spiritual power. But all this, Martin Luther says, is because they want to be emperors themselves. So they don't want... When they put an emperor into power, like they did with Charlemagne, like they did with Charles V that we were dealing here in the 16th century, and all the other Roman emperors, the Pope always was of the opinion that he had the power over this emperor. The emperor was not the sovereign. The emperor was not above the pope. The pope was above the emperor. That's the point that Martin Luther makes with all this little history lesson that we are learning here in the very final conclusion of this book. I know it is not so easy to understand. Therefore, it is maybe easier when you have your own copy of the book and you can read it for yourself and avail yourself in history lesson that you can really understand what Martin Luther writes here. But Martin Luther was not only a theologian, he was a very, very good historian too. We have to understand that. Yeah? They have also often tried to transfer the mere title yeah, from the emperor, from the Germans to France, so that they could play with this king as they did with the German emperors. For the Pope, it is only a play. And with that... Um, transferring the power from the Germans to the France and the other way around, they made sure that there was, or that in, in Germany it was seen as French, uh, France was the arch enemy, even though of course it was the Pope all along. Anyway, Martin Luther continues here, but it would really have been good if the emperors had let the Pope's paste and crowning alone. Yeah? Uh, a pope's paste and the crowning alone. This is a reference to the anointing of emperors. Yeah? It would really have been good if the emperors had let the pope's paste and crowning alone. Indeed, they can be emperors without the pope's paste or crown, which do not make an emperor. Rather, electors make an emperor, even though he were never again smeared by the pope like Louis III, Conrad I, Henry I, Conradus Suius, Rudolf, Maximilian, and many others who stayed unsmeared by the Pope. The Pope brings too much displeasure and misfortune into the Empire with his paste, with his anointing. There are surely also some bishops who survived without the pallium. Only the vote of the chapter makes a bishop, as is only right, and it would be enough for the neighboring bishop to lay his hands on him and leave the blasphemous, devouring, werewolfish monster in Rome to use his paste and hemp threat where he could. Here now, papal ass Martin Luther comes to a conclusion in the very last paragraph of this book. Here now, papal ass, with your long donkey ears and a coarse liar's mouth, the Germans have the Roman Empire not by your grace, but from Charles the Great and from the emperors in Constantinople. You have not given a hair's breadth of it, but you have stolen immeasurably amounts of it with lies, fraud, blasphemy and idolatry just as you have handled the bishops too. Like a devil, first through lies, and then with pallia, oaths and taxes. But I must leave it here. If God wills, I shall improve it 
in the second pamphlet. If I should die meanwhile, may God grant that someone else make it a thousand times worse, for this devilish popery is the last misfortune on earth, nearest to that which all the devils can do with all their might. God help us. Amen. So this brings the book of Martin Luther against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil to the final conclusion. In the last sentences I just read to you, but I must leave it here, Martin Luther says, if God wills I shall improve it in the second pamphlet. As we know today, of course, Martin Luther died less than a year after the publishing of this book and he did not get a, get a, get a chance to write this second pamphlet. He also says wisely, if I should die meanwhile, may God grant that someone else make it a thousand times worse, for this devilish popery is the last misfortune on earth, nearest to that which all devils can do with all their might. Yeah, Martin Luther died in the meantime, and his wish is that God grant that someone else make it a thousand times worse. Make what a thousand times worse? The warning that the papacy and the papacy alone is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. And when you listen to channels like mine, when you listen, first and for all, even more important than me, Inform uh, in Inquisition Update with Tom Fress, you will get that Martin Luther's wish has been granted. Because in the way that Tom Fress from Inquisition Update explains that the papacy is the Antichrist, I can do it in the same way that he does. And he did it with a lot of book readings too, and this is where I want to lay the conclusion of this book. Do your own research. Read books like from Henry Gretton Guinness, Romanism and the Reformation, or have at least a look at the playlist where of Inquisition Update on my main channel and on Romanism and the Reformation on my third channel, Jörg Lissmann, where you find all, I think, 34 parts of the book reading of Tom Fress of reading Romanism and the Reformation. When Martin Luther says here, may God grant that someone else make it a thousand times worse, well, I don't know about a thousand times, but I know that writers like James Edgar Wiley with his little pamphlet, The Papacy is the Antichrist, a demonstration, that Henry Gretton Guinness with Romanism and the Reformation, probably even other works too, like The City of Seven Hills in this poem form, but any other books, that they also taught that the papacy is the Antichrist. And the problem is that these voices are long gone. Those were voices of the 19th century, and we are now today living in the 21st century. Where are the 21st century voices? that warn the world of, as Martin Luther says here, that the devilish popery is the last misfortune on earth. Where are these warning voices today in the 21st century? The only thing that I can do is appeal to you to do your own research, to read these protestant works and first and for all to read the Bible Read the Bible in the book of Daniel, in Second Thessalonians 2, and in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, 17, 18. It is explained who the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist is. All these other secular works, like the works of Luther, like the works of Henry Gretton Guinness, James Atkin Wiley, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, or whoever you want to pick out, 
R. W. Thompson with the book on Roman civil liberty, even the work of Richard Bennett, a Catholic priest for 22 years of his life, who is now calling Catholics to get out of the church in the spirit of Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, where we can read, and I just have to open that here, give me a second on my computer, where it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. The iniquities of the whore in Rome, of Revelation chapter 17. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That woman is the Roman Catholic Church, and the head of that church is the Pope. And the papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Please avail yourselves to study the Bible, and when you understand the Bible, get confirmation in secular works of Martin Luther, Henry Gretton Guinness, James Edgar Wiley, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, or any other Protestant writer that you can lay your hand on. And understand for yourself that the devilish popery is the last misfortune on earth nearest to that which all the devils can do with all their might. God help us. Amen.